Matthew chapter number 22. Going to read a few verses. Beginning in verse number 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Now, as was Jesus' method, where do you find the Son of God at? At the house of God. While he's there, some Pharisees and some Sadducees, who were both religious elites, but they didn't even agree on some things, especially, you know, go read the book of Acts when the Apostle Paul was put on trial and he perceived that some of them were Sadducees, some of them were Pharisees. He started asking them, well, what do y'all think happens after we die? And they can't even agree on that. Because the Sadducees believed that there was no life after the grave, that we died and went to the ground just like a dog. Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the body. And I said, they didn't even agree with each other, but yet they were angry with Jesus. And not just this question. You can go back and there's a whole bunch of questions that they're asking him, trying to tempt him, trying to catch him, trying to find some fault that they could take and put him on trial that he was teaching and preaching contrary to God's commandment and God's law. So somebody said, I know what's going to get him. It was a lawyer, according to our text. He said, what's the great commandment? Right? Notice he didn't say, what's the first commandment? Okay, because we can go back to when Moses got the Ten Commandments on the mountain. We could see the first one that God wrote down. He didn't say, what's the first commandment? He said, what's the great commandment? Now see, under the law, if you're guilty of the law in one part, you're guilty of all of it. So by saying what's the great commandment, essentially he's saying, well, let's see if we can trip him up and ask him which one of the laws, which one of the commandments is most important. Because in God's eyes, they're all equally important. Because you give guilty of one, guilty of all. They all have the same importance in the eyes of God. Because what's God's standard? Holiness. He said, under the law, if you can't keep all this in your flesh, you can't be holy. That, that's why the law was our schoolmaster to show us that we were sinful. Every commandment of God, just as great as any other commandment of God. But notice, Jesus doesn't talk about the law. He says, verse number 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And he says, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he goes on to say, All the law and the prophets. Hang on those two things. Jesus didn't say this law is more important than the other. Jesus said the commandment from the beginning has been to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. If we go back, in fact, I did this with the teens one Sunday night, we can break down the Ten Commandments and everything else after that into two categories. Right? We saw, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right? Shall not have any graven images. We should keep the Sabbath day. The beginning of the Ten Commandments, what's that deal with? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Then everything after that, thou shalt not bear false witness, shall not commit adultery. Right? Children, obey your parents. It's the first commandment with promise. But what's that? That's loving others as thyself. 
All the law has to do with love God supremely and love others as God loves them. That's the entirety of the law. Jesus said, all the law and the prophets. Many times when the prophets were sent to Israel, what was the rebuke? That they left their first love. They didn't love the Lord thy God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. And because they had gotten away from God's principles, they didn't love their neighbor or their neighbor as themselves. Because once your barometer, so to speak, on what is good and what is evil is thrown off when man starts doing right in his own eye then we don't treat others as God would have us treat them we treat others as we deem they deserve Jesus said all the law and the prophets notice they didn't have an answer for him so he just kept on talking he says I got a question for you guys now Who's Christ? Notice he doesn't say when Christ comes because he was the Christ. But look in verse number 42. He says, Whose son is he? But thank you of Christ. Where does he come from? Who's he the descendant of? And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everybody else there that day they say, well, obviously he's the son of David. Well, if you go study, you can go to the beginning, book of Matthew. Even though he wasn't by blood related to Joseph, Joseph's lineage goes back to David. Then you can go to the book of Luke, and you study out that lineage, that's Mary's lineage. Guess where it goes back to? David. Right? He was a descendant of David. But we can go to the book of Revelation and find where he is the root of and the fruit of the tree of David. What's that mean? It was, was around a long time before David. He was the one that said that David would be blessed to have Christ born out of his lineage. The key wasn't David. Just like Mary, the angel told her that she was, you know, highly blessed. Because God chose her to be the vessel to bear his son into the world. Blessed among women. Right? Well, David and his lineage, just as blessed. God could have picked any of them. What about David? But in their eyes, it was all about, well, obviously the greatest king that in recorded history, the one that took the evil ways of Saul, put them in the past, Israel, like a flint, had their face pointed towards God. Then his son Solomon. Right? All throughout Solomon's reign, study your Bible, there was peace. Even when Solomon wasn't living right, God honored David, his father, and Solomon's early and young life. And he kept his promise that throughout all of Solomon's reign, Israel didn't have enemies. In fact, their former enemies came and bowed down at the feet of Solomon thinking that he was the reason that Israel was so great, but Solomon just kept pointing them, no, not me, it's God. They said, so obviously he's going to be born the son of David. He said, well, let me ask you this. He said, well, David said, referring to the Christ, he called him Lord. You do not call a descendant Lord. Right? If you may love you, your son, your daughter, right? But they come over to your house or you go over to their house. Everybody knows who's in charge. Right? You may love them, you may want to be good to them, bless them, but they're not the ones running the show, especially in Bible days. Okay, now in their time, as long as the patriarch of the family was alive, he called no one else in the family Lord. He's the head of the house. So Jesus asked the Pharisees, why would, Jesus, or why would David call the Christ Lord if he was his son? Because David would be the Lord of his house. He never called any of his sons 
Lord. In fact, when his, one of his sons tried to take the hearts of the people and the kingdom away from him, right? it broke David's heart, but he knew that Absalom had to die. He prayed that it wasn't by his hand, and God worked it out to where Absalom got hung in a tree where David didn't have to kill him, but Absalom wasn't Lord in the house as David. And any descendant of David could not claim that they were the Lord of David. That's just the way that Bible times work. But Jesus says, no, this is what David said. The Lord, and in your Bible you'll notice that that Lord, all the letters are capitalized. Right? Jesus is quoting Old Testament. If you see Lord with all capital letters, what that is, is that's the Hebrew's way of saying Jehovah. He says, the Lord, God, Jehovah, the one that lives, the I Am, said unto my Lord, and then look, not all capitals. It's got a capital L. What's he saying? God told me. He says, the Lord told this smaller Lord, thou shalt sit at my right hand. What's that mean? God's on the throne, and he showed David a place of favor. He says, if Christ is the descendant of David, how come David's not on the throne, and Christ is at his right hand? And then you'll notice it dumbfounded them so good that they stopped asking him questions after that point. Not just that day, Verse number 46 says, No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He made him real good and angry because what he was pointing out is Christ wasn't the descendant of David. Christ was God. And Christ chose David to be the line that he would be birthed through. Why well, said that he could sit on the throne of David and rule during the millennial reign. He didn't need David's throne. He's got his own. It's on the sides of the north. But he did all that through prophecy in the Old Testament so that when it was fulfilled, it would be a sign under the Jews that Christ had come. Okay, so there's your history lesson, what's going on in context. But notice, this wasn't the first time that Jesus had lawyers or Sadducees or the scribes or the Pharisees come and ask him questions trying to tempt him. But we can go to the book of Acts. And so many times the apostles were called before a court. Most of the time it was a kangaroo court, but it was a court nonetheless. And they'd be beaten. They'd be sometimes crippled. They'd have their bodies broken and then they'd be encouraged or persuaded not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. I mean, we love the story of how the Philippian jailer got saved, but in order for that to happen, the Apostle Paul and Silas, they'd been beaten, cast into the inner prison, and then shut up and locked up to where hopefully everybody just forget about them. Except there's one problem with that. God didn't forget about them. I think it's over in Psalm number 40 that God thinketh on us what do we think about well we think about we need to get gas we think about what we got to do tomorrow we got to think about all the things we got to go return because somebody that doesn't know us all that well bought us something that we didn't like I'm kidding we think of carnal things but yet God the almighty the one that we just sang about holy 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 thinks about you all the things that he could choose to think about, he thinks about us. And see, the Apostle Paul, God knew right where he was. Peter, he's bound. They're going to kill him the next day. God sends an angel down there to loose his bonds. They let him out of the city. You say, how, how, how in the world did that happen? Because God thought about them. They were on God's mind. This is an example of everything that the apostles 
went through. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote about is that spiritual warfare. You know, God uses people. Well, guess what? Sin uses people too. Wickedness uses people. Satan, there are some that have sold themselves out to him. There are some that are manipulated by the things that Satan has done to accomplish what he would have done. Because we're all free moral agents. Just as we can do something for the cause of God, somebody out there can choose to do something that doesn't have anything to do with God and has everything to do with what the devil would like to see happen. But then we're reminded we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, high places. Well, in these verses, I find how to prepare for spiritual warfare. He said, Brother Jordan, they just asked Jesus a whole bunch of questions. I know that. But everything out there can't touch us if everything in here is situated and prepared properly. What's the great commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. Over in Luke, you'll find that Jesus asked one of the elite, you know, what's the great commandment? He responded, with, love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all that strength and all our mind. Was that everything you got? Jesus told him he answered well, by the way. He got a question, right? So what do we need in order to wage spirit? You all know what commandment means, right? That's not optional. That's what God expects. That's His standard. I may not be able to get up and preach the greatest message ever preached, but you know what I can do? Love God with everything that I have. I may not be able to get up and sing a song that moves the hearts of the people that hear it, right? That the Holy Ghost can use it to pull on the heartstrings of people get them either ready to worship or get them into the altar remind them of something to where they realize how much they really do love God get them back to where they need to be I may not be able to do it but I can love God with everything that I have the standard is not what we can accomplish the standard is how invested we are if God be for us who can be against us this isn't it just a commandment from the mouth of God, it's the great commandment. In other words, Jesus is saying, God expects this from you first, chiefly. Because if you can master this, the next one's real easy. If you can love God with everything you are, you're going to start living a little bit more like Him. Those Christians in Antioch that were called Christians first, you know why they were called Christians? Because they loved God as Christ loved God the son loved the father and then because of their love for God they loved others as Christ loved others and according to Jesus all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments so if chiefly we can love the Lord our God with all our heart all our soul all our mind we will be prepared for spiritual warfare well why well if you study your Bible out, let's start in order. Love the Lord I got with all thy heart. Anytime that you see the heart referenced to in your Bible, in a metaphorical sense, it's referring to the seed of emotion in your life. The heart is where you feel. I mean, it should shock us that a thrice holy God, I mean, the last, last verse of that song we just sang, right? Blessed Trinity perfect in three persons right that all three not just one but every bit of God his heart was touched with your situation you know why we have a heart you know why we feel emotions because God made us in his image and God feels does not the Bible say that Jesus in the flesh experienced everything that anybody else would ever experience, conquered it so that he could be our high priest and be a diligent, 
effectual high priest for us. He experienced, every, not just tempted, we like that verse that he was tempted in all points like we are, but he experienced every heartbreak, every rejection, every temptation to be down and depressed. But yet he overcame so that he could minister unto us and help us overcome. Well, if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, how does that translate into spiritual warfare? Where your treasure, where, where your heart is, your treasure will be also. This right here, what you care about, that's how your life is shaped. You live your life to either have more of what you care about, keep what you care about, or to do something to help those that you care about. To take what God's given you and give it to others. But it goes the other way, man. Can I serve two masters? You cannot care and love the Lord thy God with all thy heart if your cares are carnal. Now, that's a hard thing to do. I got bills just like everybody else. I, I go to work because I have bills. Right? But God gave me the job that'll work so that my needs would be provided. When I go to work, I don't think, oh man, I got to go today. I think, I'm just glad God gave me a place that my needs could be met. Because I find having food and raiment, we're supposed to be content with. I've got more than just one set of raiment. And as you can see, I've had a whole lot of food. Most of y'all didn't help that situation with some of the gifts that y'all gave me. I might have to buy new raiment with a bigger waist size by the time I get done eating all of it. But how many of us have so much more than just food and raiment? You know why? Because God cares for you. But if I care about the carnal thing, what's that? Look at Solomon. Then consider the lilies. That in all of Solomon's glory, one lily outdoes him. God takes care of the lilies and the sparrows. They don't worry about where their next meal is going to come from, so why do we? What are they concerned with? Doing what God created them to do. You know what a lily's worried about? Blooming. You know what a sparrow's worried about? Flying and singing. But if my cares, if my emotions, the things that I care about, if they are centered out there, I cannot care about what He wants me to care about, let alone love Him with all my heart. Because He told me to take up my cross and follow Him. You know what that means? I'm dead to the world. Long before Christ gave up the ghost on that hill, it was a foregone conclusion once Pilate said take him away everybody knew Jesus was dead you heard of the phrase dead man walking it was a foregone conclusion they knew how it was going to end when he was carrying his cross after they had scourged him that was just a formality at that point they wanted to they could have killed him wherever they wanted to but they made a mockery out of him. As he bore his cross, everybody's thinking, that guy's dead. You don't pick up a cross unless you've already been sentenced to death. So what are we saying? Well, by taking up my cross, this world is no longer my home. This world has nothing eternal that I should care about other than other people's souls. The majority of it is wood, hay, and stubble. I'm supposed to love the Lord my God with all my heart. Well, let's go on to the soul. What is the soul? Well, that's the part of you that is eternal. 
God breathed into man the breath of life and man became a living soul. God wasn't breathing into any deers or whales or elephants or anything else that he made. They were alive, but they were not a soul. Your soul... Now, but a little, this may just be theology according to Brother Jordan. But your soul, I believe, is where God put that measure of faith that he gave to every man. Because how were we saved? By grace through faith. God made faith that into that eternal part of you, your soul. He put that in there. Why? Because my faith doesn't stop when the body dies. My faith has eternal consequences. God offered it through grace, but I had to accept it through faith. Your soul is where you make them eternal choices. But how are we supposed to love God? With all our soul. What's that mean? With all your faith. Without doubting. Without speculation. Pure and honest faith. God cares about or a lot about that faith because he said suffer not the little children to come unto me because just out of pure and innocent faith they believed that Jesus was who he said he was the disciples tried to shoo him off said hey don't bother him he said no 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 if you offend one of these little ones it would be better for you to have a millstone hung around your neck cast out into the ocean He's saying, they are acting on that thing that God gave them, that faith. But how do you love God with all your soul? Well, your soul, that's that thing that can be grieved. And I can't remember if we taught on it, or if I gave you all the definition. But to be grieved, according to Webster's Dictionary, Figuratively, what it means is to be torn apart as by hooks. It feels like you've got something tearing you into two different pieces. I mean, the apostle, how long halts you between two opinions? That's what it is to be grieved. You're torn in two directions and you don't know which way to go, so you anchor. And every day, it's like you're being pulled apart on the inside. Now see, if I want to love God with all my soul, I can't be grieved. I can't be indecisive. I can't let the events of the world, the events of life, the cares of this life, the flesh, get to the point where it has enough sway over me to where it can grieve me. I mean, Brother Greg, with all of his quotes, that he's got written down in his Bible. Sister Tammy took photos of him the last time he was here. She's like, I want to see all them quotes. He's got pages in his Bible. That's why, he, that's why a few years ago he had it, a new cover put on it because he didn't want to buy a new one. He had all them quotes written down everywhere throughout it. But one of my favorites, he that angers you, controls you. Well, again, that's an emotion. But you know why those that anger us or those that we love, or those things that we care about, you know why they can grieve us? Because we've decided that they are important to us. That goes back to the heart. The only thing that can grieve you is something that has sway over you. To love the Lord thy God with all thy soul means the only thing that truly matters to you is what God's opinion is. In your soul, it is anchored that doesn't matter what this person what my flesh what the boss what the world what the White House what Frankfurt doesn't matter regardless of that those are all secondary tertiary on down the line the thing that my faith is settled in is heavenly it is in him the one that died for me the one that promised that he would be there for me closer than any friend that could stick closer than a brother. He's a part of me. He lives and dwells in me. Where do you think the Holy Ghost took up residence when he sealed you until the day of promise? In your soul. 
To be grieved in your soul is to truly have those things that your soul cares about that don't line up with God. Let's back up. When David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, where do you think that that was etched at? I mean, New Testament said that it would be engraved in fleshy tables of our heart become a part of us what is it that's us exercising our faith and saying Lord in my soul deep down in the gable end of your soul as you may have had it you know heard it said before some things are just settled why is that because you believe it if you believe God help you if you do that a politician knows what's best for your health right God help you but if that's the case, you're going to be grieved when it comes time to do what God wants you to do and it doesn't line up with what the CDC says. Why is that? Because your faith is split. And anything that is not of faith is sin. To love thy God with all thy soul means with all your faith with all your eternal being. That's what God fellowships with. He doesn't fellowship with this flesh. He fellowships with your soul. We can't see Him with these carnal eyes. We can't hear Him with these carnal ears. But yet His Word speaks to our soul because the Word is spiritually discerned. Spirit's already indwelling in us. If we've been saved, what's He talking to? Your soul. Why does He talk to your soul? Because you use that faith that He made a part of you, that He gave you the same measure as everybody else, and you exercised it and put it in Him. To love Him with all your soul is to say, I find more valuable those things which right now we see dimly through a glass. I don't know what His audible voice sounds like, but I know what it sounds like when He's talking. And that voice means more to me than any voice that I can hear in the world. That by faith, even though it's not as God intended it to be, one day it will be. We'll see Him as He is. For all of eternity, we'll be like Him and we'll be with Him. But how do we get to that point? How do we get away from that point? Well, your soul can't care about temporal things. You can put faith in people. You can put faith in yourself. You can put faith in what you think God's going to do, not knowing that God's going to throw a U-turn in this thing, a fork in the road that you never saw coming. Well, why didn't we see it coming? Because by faith, we were looking at what we thought God was going to do rather than asking Him what He was going to do. Or really, more important, I don't need to know what he wants to do. I just need to know what he wants me to do. When we start thinking that we figured out who God wants us to be, well, I know what he wants us to be. He wants us to be like Christ. Well, what's that like? I don't know. I'm not holy, but he was. Well, what's it like to be holy? I'll let you know when I get there. But right now, we're not there yet. We will be one day whether I go through the grave or he calls us up into the, the clouds with the shout with the voice of the archangel trumpet blows we out of here we're going to be just like him but until that day I don't know what it's like to be holy so I can't figure out what God wants me to be I have to be led I've got some clues like in order to be what God wants me to be i got to love the Lord my God with all my heart with all my soul with all my mind I know I can't be what God wants me to be if I'm going around backbiting and tail bearing and everything else. No, I can't be what God wants me to be if I'm not giving my tithe. And we're not even going to get on and an offering. Why is that? Because some people just don't believe that they should do. They don't have enough faith realize that if God said it he meant it 
with all your soul. That's just to believe every jot and tittle. Doesn't mean that you've got to be able to understand it. But why does God want you to do that? I don't know. I just believe He wants me to do it. You don't have to have all the answers in order to believe it. But with all your soul, you're saying, Lord, I stake my eternal salvation on faith. I'm going to stake my life on faith. We're going to die out to believing that this world knows what's best for me, that the world can provide for me. I believe that truly, if I needed water, and there wasn't none around, God can make it come out of a rock. I believe if every automobile, boat, and everything else stopped working, and God wanted you to get across an ocean, He'd make a way to get across the ocean. Whether you got to be swallowed up by a whale and then puked out on the other beach, or whether He parts the Red Sea. And say, Brother Jordan, that's ridiculous. No, I just believe it could happen. And here's the thing. They do not say, call unto me, now I answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things with thou. No, it's not. You know why we know that? Because God's done it before. But he's saying, I've got, you have no idea what I'm capable of. I just believe he's capable of doing it all. To love him with all your soul is to say, God, truly, not what I can understand. It's not what I can figure out. I just believe that you know what's best. It is in your soul through faith that you surrender unto God. Then it says, with all thy mind. Truly, the mind is the gateway to your whole being. It's through your mind that your ears are plugged in and your eyes are plugged in. Your nose is plugged in. Right, all everything that comes in to our heads, where does it get filtered out at in your brain? That through training your mind, that's where you turn all the red lights and the green lights on inside of your brain to where certain things just get blocked out. And those things which you've decided to come in, those things come in. What do you think our pastor says that 90% of the bat battles fought right here? because it's this thing that chooses what we listen to, what we watch where we go how we deal with other people this is the decision maker but to love the Lord thy God with all thy mind what does that mean? well it means that I'm not making the decisions according to what I believe lean not under your own understanding but if a man thinketh that he's staying, let him take heed lest he fall. It's not about what we think, it's about what God says we should think. That takes effort. You've got to train yourself to do that. But with all your mind, you've got to go into the world. Jesus was in the world. Right? But the world did not affect him. Why is that? He had to, just like we have to, compel his flesh to do the will of the Father. Well, where did that warfare take place? Right here. His flesh ached and moaned and rejected and bucked just as much as everybody else's. But what did he do? He compelled it. He overcame everything that we have to deal with so that he could be proven to be the lamb without spot and without blemish. You know what he did? He kept every single one of the laws and commandments. Not because he had to, but to prove to us that he was what we needed. But Well, if I love him with all my mind, that means that just as, you know, we can go over to the book of Job where the devil said, you've hedged Job in too good. Right? Just like God hedges us in, and only allows certain things into our life, if we love Him with all our mind, we'll put our own hedges up. Safeguards. No, I don't do that. I don't listen to this. I'm not even going to watch that because I know it's going to make my flesh angry. Right? When we do start feeling certain emotions, because right? we are human, be angry and sin not. 
Right? Nothing's wrong in the anger. What's wrong is when we start dwelling on it long enough up here that we start taking action. Right? We love them with all our heart. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to get upset. Right? If we go back through the lens of time, hindsight being 2020. I can honestly say I've been upset with a lot of people that claim to be all in for the ministry. But did I let it drag me out of church? No. Because what I thought about them, how much I cared about them, didn't compare with how much I cared about God. Where did that decision happen? Right here. When I do have a bad day, right, what brings me back to this right? you got to make the decision to either think on these things as the Bible says is there anything good anything pure right? where do you get those from you've got them stored up in here why do you think memorizing your Bible is so important because if I can think on it it can help me in the moment he promised to be a present help in time of trouble. Present means right now. Doesn't matter when you look at present, present means now. Well, how can he help us now if we didn't equip ourselves the way that he said? Where does that happen? Right up here. Loving him with all your mind doesn't mean that every thought, every single day has to be about Jesus. But what it does mean is that this up here has been conditioned to where you can do what God wants you to do. So many people do nothing for God because they can't make up their mind if they're going to do something or how they're going to do something or what somebody else will think. Again, that's more about cares of the heart. Eventually, you've just got to get that thing in you that you've got to go and do. Jesus said, go. That's it. Not think, not ponder, not go and source out everybody else's opinion on how it's going to work. That's a matter of the soul. I just believe God's going to work it out. Right? But all three go hand in hand. But, but Jordan, you said we were talking about spiritual warfare. Yep. You do realize that the whole armor of God most of it has to do with preparing ourselves that we can go along rocky roads, we can stand in harsh conditions. Right? We're girded so that we're unencumbered with the world. That's all external things. There's two pieces that deal with the heart, the soul, and the mind. Breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation. Everything else is to equip you to where you can stand. Those are to protect you from the fiery darts of the devil, the wiles of the devil. But those are to keep you to where those things are in the fight. If you go out in the world and you care more about what somebody else thinks than what God thinks, you're not fighting a spiritual warfare. If you can come into the house of God and hear about how God's got an answer for all your problems, but when you go out there and you ask a shrinker, a doctor, or somebody else, you're not fighting a spiritual warfare. If you go out there and you haven't filtered out all of the nonsense that's in the world that can distract you, that can deter you, or depress you, and you're just absorbing that all day long, what do you think your life's going to be? Distracted, dejected, and depressed. You know where it all starts? Lord, this is all that I am. It's not much. But it says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. Make, we understand loving with all our emotion. But what about loving with all our soul? That means that God's presence and God's touch is more dear to us. That fellowship is more dear to us than anything that we could find out there. That even if we've had a great service in here, when he just shows out every now and then, you know what 
are the most dear moments of my life when it's just me and him and something that can't be put into words happens but because he cares for me the Holy Ghost takes them groanings and utterings the son seated at the right hand of the father making intercession for us God does what I don't even know that I need just because he thinks on us to love him with all your mind that's where you love him enough that you say Lord I love you so much I don't need this don't care about this even if I'm interested in it may not be sinful may not be wicked but Lord you mean more to me than that and I know that that could draw me away from you there's blessing and cursing and everything the things that you might need to avoid I may not need to and vice versa but the point is this if I love him with all my mind that means that I love him so much I don't want anything to come between us so I set up hedges in my life that nothing's getting through that because if I go through that hedge I know what's going to happen I'm going to be pulled away from him why do you think that he refers to us so often as a husbandman keeping his vineyard because I've got to go around and make sure that the hedge is still there because a stray thought one day when we're not prepared to go out into the world with a fortified mind with a strengthened mind with a mind that's focused on the things of God it's real easy to be carried away so when we're saying preparing for spirit every day we've got to ask the Lord Lord my strength the arm of flesh will fail me and Lord I don't know much but I do know that I love you so strengthen my love for you strengthen my mind strengthen my heart strengthen my soul so that when we go out here today Lord I, we already know he's not going to let anything come into our life that we're not equipped to handle he doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able right he's got he's got 99.99% he just asked us by faith to do our best we say Lord help me because if I was enough Jesus wouldn't have had to come loving him with all that you are starts with understanding that you're not enough but he can help you be the servant that you need to be he can help you love like only he can love and if we love him supremely that's when we can really start fighting a spiritual warfare but you can have the whole armor of God on if your mind's not in the fight you're not in the fight if your heart's not in the fight you're not in the fight and if you don't believe in your soul that you need to be in the fight you're not going to be in the fight if you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.